For the first time ever, I'm standing inside a 3D printer. There you are, welcome back. Yes, I'm standing inside a 3D printer. This is the Massivit 1800 Pro. And with a build volume five feet on X, four feet on Y, and six feet on Z or Z, you could print some incredible things like my buddy Erez here, or like me right here. You know, we've got a really cool project planned with this machine and we're gonna print something amazing, but I wanna know what you wanna print on this machine. What would you print with a build volume this large? So keep that in mind because I'm gonna take you on a tour of the machine and I'm gonna show you what makes it go. The Massivit 1800 Pro is so large, it doesn't fit into a shipping container. In order to do that, the roof is lowered 14 inches. You can see there and there is kind of where it comes down. Now it's at your facility and you're gonna to wanna to grab a friend because it takes two to get this thing leveled and in place. And then the legs are dropped. The industrial casters are raised and we can start to talk about the power to raise the roof. The power requirements for the Massivit 1800 Pro are substantial. You're gonna want 400 volts, three phase. It brings that into the machine and it actually breaks that up into 240 volt, 52 volt, and 24 volt legs. And before you power anything on, those different legs are verified to be within 5% of the given voltage rating. So within 5% of 240, 52, and 24 volts. Once the power is tested and verified to be within the specs, they can actually flip all of these circuit breakers and power on the motion of the machine and actually get it going. We're on the other side of the machine and this is where materials are loaded. But one of the things I wanted to point out first is this vacuum right here. It's huge and this introduces a vacuum on the build platform, bringing that glass down to that platform and just making it as level as possible. In fact, you only get a half of a millimeter variance between edge to edge. It's incredible. Materials for this machine are loaded via a 19 kilogram pail and they come in here. And in order to add a material, first you have to raise the follower plate out of the pail. It's got a little seal around it. And then once that's out of the way, you can pull the old pail and put the new pail of material. The follower plate is then lowered into the pail with the material. And you're going to introduce a, an air bubble at this point, it's unavoidable. So what this part here is for is bleeding off that last air bubble. You don't want to send air bubbles into the machine. But once that's installed and good to go and the air bubbles bled off, you're ready to send material to the nozzle. Now we're inside the machine and we're going to talk about the build platform. Remember, five feet by four feet by six feet. It's massive and you're going to be printing massive things and you need to make sure those massive things are adhered to the build plate. How does that happen? For this, the first layer of gel is deposited onto the build plate and then it's not cured. And that allows the gel to sort of run out just a little bit because now the second layer and above, when that's laid down, that's gonna be cured. And that second layer curing is going to cure that first layer that's run out and actually widened a little bit. And if you think about consumer level 3D printing, that sounds an awful lot like a brim, which it is. This is an example of what happens. This brim right here is the first layer and it's cured, but it was only cured because of the second layer and above. The cure in that first layer after it's run out provides fantastic adhesion to this build plate. It's not heated. So the glass and this material are just held in place for hours while massive things are being printed. A massive machine like this, you probably are wondering how everything moves. X and Y are on linear rails and Z or Z actually powers the table with these giant ball screws. And the table is what's referred to as global Z. It's a global Z axis because it's dual gantry and these are essentially the print heads. And each one of these print heads has their own small Z, which can travel essentially 150 to 170 millimeters, give or take. But this opens up an incredible world of creativity. Because when you think about dual gantry, independent extruder 3D printers, you think of printing the same model twice, or you think of printing one model and a mirror image of that model, that can happen. But with this Massivit 1800 Pro, you can do two of the same model. You can do one model with a mirror image of that model. You can also do two different models like I showed you in the beginning with me and with Erez. Those were printed at the same 
time. Not only that, but because of this small z per print head, you can now have different layer heights per model. So if you need something that doesn't have a lot of detail to print fast, you can. And you can have something that has a lot of detail with lower layer heights. It's amazing to think about because it opens up what this machine can actually do. And if you think about it, you're actually buying two 3D printers in the same box. Yes! With the massive print volume, you do need to dispense a lot of material. And that's what we're gonna talk about now. The material from that pail ends up coming this way down here and into the dispenser. This dispenser is going to extrude the gel material through here and out through this nozzle right here. Now this nozzle size is going to determine the size of the bead, the width and the height, and the nozzle is interchangeable, which means you can change the width and the height of the bead that you want to extrude. And then around the circumference of the nozzle are all of these UV LEDs. And what that allows is for curing that gel, no matter the direction of travel. So you can print this way, this way, this way, this way, this way, it doesn't matter those UV LEDs are gonna cure it as it prints. During the print process, the gel material can build up on the nozzle. It's just unavoidable. And so there are ways to mitigate that, and it's in two different parts. One of the first parts is this brush back here. The print head can move back to this brush and the bristles will clean gelatinous material off of the nozzle. It's actually cool to see. The second way is actually ingenious. The nozzle itself has a built-in cleaning mechanism. If there is any gel, cured or not, on the side of the nozzle that's built up, there is a plunger activated by air that removes any bits of gelatinous material on the side of the nozzle, and it does it really quickly. And once it does that, the print process is ready to keep going. How do you use a large 3D printer such as this? I was thinking about that, and I wanted to sort of relate it to how a lot of us use 3D printers at home when we have consumer machines. We have the ability to move X, Y, and Z. We have the ability to preheat the nozzle. We have the ability to jog the material. And that's the same thing here. So this is just motion basic. And there's a lot of different things that you can do here. But on a daily basis, this is really the screen that's needed because you can jog the X and Y axes. You can jog the global Z axes, which is the build platform. You have access to the different gantries and their small Zs as well. You can dispense the material out of the right and the left nozzle. You have the ability to move the pump. And really at this point, it should be relatable. So anybody who's thinking about getting started in 3D printing, in the industrial side of additive manufacturing, a lot of those skills that you've developed with your machine in the garage or your machine at school or in the makerspace actually apply to daily use here. Oh, and guess what? At the end of each print head is a camera allowing you a close-up view of the nozzle and whether or not anything is built up. And if you see it, you can initiate a cleaning process. And I'm on the camera, which I guess means I should be cleaned. That's it. Now it's time to start a print job. And in order to do that, I shouldn't be in here because if these lights were to activate while I was in here,